That's a rule of thumb. That's a rule you can live by. My Bible is open to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus is the second book of the Bible, chapter 31. I'm going to read real fast because it's right now 1130. 1131. And then, you know, Bishop, you do not have that long to preach. I'm going to read real fast the first 11 verses. Then the Lord spoke, are you with me? Exodus 11, I'm sorry, 11, I'm sorry, Exodus 31, verses 1 through 11. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for settings, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, indeed I, have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you. <clears throat> the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the labor and its base, the garments of the ministry, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests, and the anointed oil, and sweet incense for the holy place. According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. Now, the, the real text went all the way down through verse 18. That was what's going to be read in the scripture tonight, but y'all went to talking in tongues and dancing and stuff, so <laughs> couldn't nobody read the Bible. This is the word of the Lord. I want to talk to you. For, for those of you all that have been keeping up coming through the close of 2015, Pastor Tony and I have been preaching a series on faith. We've been talking about increasing our faith. And, and while I recognize that moving forward, um, that we need to we need to focus on where, where the Lord is moving us. But as I begin to read this text, there are at least three themes that are coming out in the text. One of the theme is building. One of the themes is worship. And then uh, uh, hidden in a very clandestine clandestine way in that text is the theme of faith. And so tonight, I'm going to take the next few moments that have been allotted unto me, and I'm going to talk about this is our message tonight, Martin. This is for the, 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 the CDs. Faith to focus on the future. I want to close 2015 and take us into 2016 with this thought. Faith to focus on the future. Now let me say this to you. I'm going to do more prophesying than preaching tonight. So, so, so prophecy, prophecy has to be, has to be just received. You gotta reach up and get it when it's for you. Which means I'm, I'm typically more of a systematician when I preach. I'm typically more of, of a hermeneutic when I preach. I'm typically more of a didactic preacher, but I won't be so tonight apart from the introduction. I wrote out my introduction so that way I would at least be coherent when I did that part. Because when I wrote my other notes, which I sometimes do not even do that, but I did that tonight because I want to make sure that I was focused enough to be able to tell you in bulleted fashion what I sense the Spirit is saying to, to, uh, to us for, to develop faith to focus on the future. Faith comes by and hearing by. And so as we hear the word tonight, as we have heard the inscripturated word, and now we'll hear the charismatic word, the proclaimed word over us, I believe that we're going to develop faith to focus on the future. Why do you say that, Bishop? And I'm going to let you know, I want to tell you this is all introduction. That is, I say that because some of us can't move forward because we don't have the faith to believe that God's going to do something different tomorrow than he did yesterday. Some of us have already resolved in our minds that 2016 is going to be more of the same. But I came to break the back of the devil over your life tonight and let you know that all of your tomorrows are going to be better than all of your yesterdays if you can lay hold of faith 
to focus on the future. Encourage three people and tell them, develop faith tonight. Time to get faith for the future. Once you've told three people, take your seats. I'm moving fast, y'all. The story of Bezalel and Aholiab comes in the middle of the section of Exodus dedicated to the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. The book of Exodus itself is prophetic in its name. You do realize that Old Testament Pentateuch names do not derive from Hebrew origins, but rather from Greek. Even though there are about Hebrew people and written during the times of the patriarchs, the canonization of scripture brought to them Greek names, and I think it's important to recognize that because Exodus is the compound word from two Greek words. The word ek, which means from, of, or out, and hadas, which means road, path, or way. Exodus means the way out. Some of y'all just need to read through the book of Exodus in 2016, because God's trying to show you a way out. A way out of debt, a way out of poverty, a way out of bad relationships, a way out of trouble, a way out of depression, God's just going to give you a way out. I don't know who needs to hear it, but he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit would say to the church. They, the, the children of Israel were tra tra traversing the terrain called the wilderness. This was the in-between place wherein they were removed from their previous reality of slavery and deprivation, yet not having fully realized their final rest in Canaan. It was an in between place, let's all say in between place. <laughs> they had traveled too far to return to Egypt, yet they seem to have a great distance to travel before they reach the promised land. They had made progress, but they had not obtained the prize. They rejoiced because they were no longer under Pharaoh's whip, yet they wondered when would this journey have you ever been in a in-between place? The strange backdrop to this narrative is the fact that they were building a tabernacle of worship before they settled into their new home. They were instructed by God through Moses to construct a portable tabernacle such that they could worship while on their journey. It seems that God was interested in them growing comfortable worshiping him no matter where they were or what the situation was. They were learning to worship God where they were for where they were going. Sometimes you and I have to learn how to worship God for where he's taking us even though where we are isn't where we want to be. The knowledge that God had promised them a land of their own was a foregone yet futuristic reality. They had waited intergenerationally for over 400 years to see this promise fulfilled. They were now looking forward to the day in which the word of the Lord concerning them would come to pass. Theirs was a stubbornly courageous disposition a hopeful anticipation mixed with eschatological longing. All right. All right. Their praise was an indication of their relief from suffering, but in a very real way, their worship and praise pointed to a time and place beyond their current reality. They praised God for what he had brought them out of. But, it would, but simultaneously, they were praising God for where he was taking them. As they constructed the tabernacle in the wilderness, they made the clarion statement that we have faith to focus on the future. I'm going to try it again because I saw it a little bit past you. As they constructed, as they built, as they erected the tabernacle in the wilderness, they were making the clarion 
that we have faith to focus on the future. You see, no one builds anything without having the future in mind. Building a place of worship has the double meaning of praising God for the past and anticipating a bright future. Some of y'all are confused when folks start shouting and dancing and running victory laps around the sanctuary and you don't realize that somebody next to you on your left is praising them for what he's done and somebody on your right is praising them and dancing about what he's about to do and somebody's running a victory lap for the things he's doing right now in their life. It's too early to touch somebody but encourage your neighbor and tell them don't worry about why I'm praising him. Some of y'all ain't said nothing to nobody. Tell somebody right don't Shit! 
nobody else, but for all you've been through for the last three years, you have made it to the place of an unstoppable promise. I dare you to prophesy to seven people around you and tell them your promise is unstoppable in 2016. What God promised you, he's going to bring to pass. What God said to you, he's going to do. What God told you, he's going to make good on. If God be for you, who can be against you? For all the hell you went through for the last three years, this is the year of unstoppable promises.
that's what Elohim means, the God who creates. The God who steps out on nothing and tells the angels, I think I'll make me a world. And all the angels have to say, what's a world, God? And he says, I'll show you I'm about to create it. Some of y'all will step out in front of your naysayers, your enemies, and the people that have been talking about you. And tell them, I'm going to show you how to create a job. I'm going to show you how to create a business. I'm going to show you how to create a godly family. I'm going to show you how to create your own way out of the trials and tribulations you've been going through. The people brought materials for them to work with. The people brought materials for them to work with in their creative efforts. And as I began to think about that, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. And they only fashioned the implements for the tabernacle using the materials that the people brought and put in their hands. And the Spirit spoke to me and said, some of your members are in trouble going into 2016 because they're worrying about what they don't have in their hands rather than what I've already put in their hands. When you are filled with the Spirit, not only do you have the anointing to create, but you have the anointing to work with what you have to work with. Y'all don't like that kind of talk right here. See, some of y'all don't know you won't make it on $100,000 a year because you couldn't make it on $30,000 a year. If you would learn how to be creative with $30,000 a year, God could bless you with $100,000 a year because you've learned how to work with what's in your hand. You can't fight with what somebody else has in their arsenal. you got to learn to work with what you got in your hand. work 
work with him. So I had to work with what I had to work with him. They didn't have no money. They had no cars. I had to pick up all of them on the way to church. And I ended up hanging outside a Volkswagen Jetta trying to get to church. I had to hurry up, get over there, and then I had to own the key. So I had to get there first because I had to open the bill and turn on the lights. And I had to go around the corner and get that little one to beat the drums and get in there because we had to have church in Jesus' name. But I'm going to tell you something. When you learn how to work with what God gives you to work with, God will take that little bit of stuff you start with and he'll multiply it until you can't sit and y'all don't like this kind of talk. Right? Tell your neighbor around you. Tell three or four people, God's going to multiply you because you've been working with what he gave you. God's going to take your fixed income and teach you how to live good on it. God's going to multiply the little effort that you've been putting forward because you've been working with what he put in your hand. I'm almost in 2016. I, 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 I got hurt. I got hurt. I got hurt. Okay. Let me say these next two things. The next three minutes. That's this. The, the next thing the text says in verse 6 is it says something very peculiar. He says, And I, indeed, I have appointed with him a holy other son of a Hasimah of the tribe of Dan. And I put wisdom, listen to this, I put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans. I've put wisdom in their hearts. Now, the King James Version says that I called the wise hearted and put wisdom in their hearts. And I began to ask the question, Lord, if they're wise hearted already, what's the necessity for putting wisdom in their hearts? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, wise heartedness is not a position. It's a disposition. Wise-hearted people are people who are inclined to wisdom. Let me see if I can help you. Some of y'all are going to succeed in 2016 because you like folly too much. The wise-heartedness seems to equate with a, with a willingness to receive wisdom. In other words, those who are willing to receive wisdom in 2016 will be wise. You can always tell one who's wise-hearted because they enjoy walking with wise people. You can always tell fools because they laugh at wise stuff. Wise-hearted persons understand that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all that getting. Wise-hearted people put away folly and do not despise wisdom. Bezalel and each of the artisans that worked with them used their skills to build or craft or construct the tabernacle of meeting which was the place of worship. The goal of the anointing that came upon the was to construct something with which to worship God. Play under me on that. Some of us have received a Bezalel and a Holy Ab anointing already. But some of us have used it to build something other than to worship God. Some of us have been anointed to build. But we've taken that anointing and we've given it to everything other than the house of God. And the text says that they were anointed to build the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was for the purpose of worshiping God. And you only build when you're focusing on the future. And you only worship when you anticipate God doing something in your life. We must reprioritize worship as the number one goal of this church in 2016. Not programming. Not mercy, mercy ministry. Not social gatherings. Not pet projects. Not building for status. Not clicks, clubs, hookups, dates, or business networking. Not fame or fortune. 
not name recognition or trying to be discovered. Not a place to complicate my conscience because I know I've done wrong in the world. Our primary goal and assignment is to worship God in the beauty of holiness. When we worship Him, He brings about miracles, healings, deliverance, restoration, peace, wholeness, and salvation. Here's the beautiful thing. The skills, I told you two things, it was really three, because here's the last two. Though Bezalel and Aholiab showed up in an instant in scripture and after this pericope were heard again no more. After chapter 36 you'll hear them no more. Though they showed up instantly and then vanished, you do realize that their skill as artisans took a lifetime of preparation. Which means though they showed up in an instant they were moving toward it all their lives. May I suggest to you tonight, those of you that have faith to focus on the future, that you have been working toward what God's about to release in 2016. You've spent the last 25 years moving toward it. And when you cross over into 2016, as we just done three minutes ago, you're going to walk into that which you have been moving toward.
Some of y'all can't clap and say amen because you don't even know what the anointing is. That's what your problem is. When you give your gifts, talents, and abilities over in the house of God, then God can anoint it such that when you use it outside of the house of God, it's not just skilled, talented, and gifted, but it is anointed. And it's the anointing that opens the doors. It's the anointing that makes ways. It's the anointing that gives you access. It's the anointing that gets you promotion. Your problem is you're trying to get those things by skill, but you got to put them in here to get some oil. Everything I've ever learned and everything I've ever done professionally in life that's sustained me then and even now. It's not only sustained me, but caused me to thrive, prosper. Every bit I developed in the house of God. I make a living running my mouth. I generate, I minister, I teach, instead of first class and students. Everything I learned, I learned in the house of God. When I was a professional musician, <coughs> played all over the world, sang various gospel artists, road manager, and all kinds of stuff. I learned in the house of God. I like some musicians. I feel like you're an old soul. You, you're young like some of these musicians. Some young musicians don't know nothing about playing somewhere and not getting paid. They don't know nothing about just serving and being happy that somebody let you. I gave years of my life from a child framing on the piano, plucking on the organ, Learning how to play and sing, teach parts, yes, work with the choir, yes, trying to help the church get to where they need to be musically. They didn't have no money for me. They were mad when I didn't show up, but they didn't pay me when I did come. <laughs> but what I, I and I had attitude. I was, you know, I was hearty and all kinds of arrogant felt felt. I said, "They ought to be paying me." You know, ABC Church around the corner. They'll pay me seventy five dollars a week to come in there and do what I do in my church for free. And my mama would make me come and play in my church because she knew something. She knew that I wasn't getting dollars, but there was some oil dripping down on me. I've had ministers, young preachers, minister good, ask me. I got called out, somebody asked me to preach. What should I charge in honorary? This is what you do. You, you tell them you'll pay them $250 to let you come preach in that church. Yeah. 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 Since you're just practicing and learning the craft. Yeah. Don't nobody know you and don't nobody want you. They're giving you a break and they called you because you want to mind this. The oil for out there 
is it here? Yeah. You better hear me. My, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to practice in my own home. My kid has had three opportunities to play for other churches on Sundays. I said, what? Yeah. They're going to pay me. They're going to pay me more than you pay me. She's holding you back from being able to be promoted. God's getting ready to move a Deborah 